Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Archana Bindra. Dr. Archana Bindra is board certified in endocrinology and internal medicine. Dr. Bindra currently practices medicine in the field of endocrinology. So what is diabetes? Essentially, when we talk about diabetes, we're talking about high levels of glucose in the blood. And you can have high levels of glucose that come from either an abnormal insulin production, that you don't have enough of insulin, like as people who have type 1 diabetes, or you have the insulin, but sometimes it doesn't work as well. That means it's, you're utilizing it in a wrong way, and that would be in type 2 diabetes. And sometimes it's a mixture of both which is very commonly seen in type 2 diabetes. So how do we keep our sugars normal? Essentially, but to, in order to keep your glucose at a normal level, the pancreas secretes, this is the pancreas, and it secretes a, a hormone called insulin. The insulin in turn brings that glucose down to normal. When it's too low, the pancreas secretes something called glucagon. So the pancreas secretes two hormones that work exactly opposite to each other, and that would actually increase your blood glucose levels to keep it in the normal range. Like we always wonder how we could go to bed at night and we wake up in the morning and we haven't eaten for 10 hours, but we're still alive. And that's partly because your body, with the help of glucagon, is able to make some blood glucose overnight through your, with the help of your liver and keep you in control. So when we think about type 2 diabetes, most of us go to the doctor, and a lot of us, I'm sure, have experienced that when we were diagnosed, our sugar was, I don't know, 300 or 250 or something really high. And when we walked in, we thought that was the day we were diagnosed. But truly, we were diagnosed, we probably had it for about 10 years prior. So if you look at this graph, it tells you the timeline at the bottom. It also tells you what it's talking about is relative function of what we call beta cells. And it's talking about your glucose levels. And as we see, the time you get diagnosed, you've already had it for so many years before that, but you got picked up in the office that you went to. And that's when you got diagnosed. So how many of you who have diabetes check only a fasting blood sugar? And check once a day, and, and the only one that you check is a fasting. Well, a lot of times, the sugar that actually goes up first is not the fasting. It's actually the one after your meals. It's the postprandial sugars or the post-meal sugars that are the first to rise. So the one that the green line that you see shows you that the, it's, it's rising way before this this lavender or pink colored line that you see at the bottom, which is the fasting glucose. And that rise is first noted. And a lot of people check only fasting glucose, so you miss that rise for a while until you actually get diagnosed. So the ones who are checking once a day probably should be checking more than once a day, maybe sometime in the afternoon after a little lunch or breakfast or dinner or something in order to detect that rise. There's also, of course, factors such as obesity or genetics that if you have a strong family history of type 2 diabetes, the more inactive that you are, the more sedentary a life that you lead, you would probably develop diabetes. And if you do, it may be due to those factors. And one can avoid some of them, maybe not the genetics so much. We get what we get. but we can avoid the obesity and the inactive lifestyle, for sure. So what they're trying to say here is that you're given a certain number of beta cells when you're born. It's like somebody giving you a, a pocket full of, you're allowed to spend $1,000. And 
if you go and you lose your thousand dollars over time, then that's pretty much how you're basically left with that much money for the month. And it depends on how you spend it. So whether you spend it all very quickly or you spend it slowly over the time. So it depends on how well you take care of your beta cells. It depends. So if you take care of them well, they will last for a long, much longer time. You may never develop diabetes. And all those factors depend on how well you take care of yourself. Okay, so you can see that as the beta cells start declining, you start developing diabetes. And then you're, you start going on insulin and, or other medications to treat diabetes. And at this point down the line, when you've had it for a long period of time, you basically do not have insulin secretion. And if you do have some secretion, maybe it's not working as well. So what is insulin resistance? Well, you keep hearing it from your from your doctors, they say, oh, you're insulin resistant. So insulin is required for glucose to get into a cell. It's sort of like your key. The key sometimes fits into this hole, but with all your high cholesterol and everything, it gets all jammed up. So it's this hole that gets jammed up with all your high fats and stuff. It doesn't allow that insulin key to fit in in order for the glucose to enter into the cell. So a lot of times, if somebody doesn't have diabetes, if somebody who doesn't have it, if it was given insulin, it would drop your glucose by a fair amount, maybe by 50 points. But somebody who has insulin resistance, it would only drop it by maybe 10 or 12 points. So essentially, it's doing its job. But it's because of this jammed effect, it's not able to get glucose to where it needs to go. So what is your definition of diabetes? A lot of you came to us this morning with those numbers, and you were asked, what does this mean? So essentially, anything less than 5.7, you would consider it normal. That is what we call a hemoglobin A1c. A hemoglobin A1c is essentially your glucose, which is tagged to a red blood cell in your body. And that is checked every three months. So it's monitoring your sugars over a period of three months. And the number that we look for is to be less than 5.7, to be absolutely normal. If you were to fall between 5.7 and 6.4, you would fit in a category called pre-diabetes. And anything more than 6.5 would be considered as diabetes. Now that correlates to what we call a fasting glucose that if you check in the morning, it should be less than 100. So a lot of you who were fasting this morning and got your glucose checked was less than 100, then we're all good. If we fall between this category of 100 to 125, we would think about prediabetes, have an A1C checked at your doctor's office, and make sure what category you fall into. And if you were to be between 140 to 199, that's after a meal, two hours after a meal, we call this impaired glucose tolerance. So, but once you start crossing 6.5, or you go more than 126 in the morning, or more than 200 after a meal, then you have diabetes, okay? So the number that you wanna focus on is the 6.5 and the 5.7. So what is this hemoglobin A1C? We just talked about it. The glucose gets tagged on to red blood cells, and it gives you something called a glycosylated hemoglobin. So if your red blood cells were to be very low, like if you were to be bleeding a lot, or you had some form of anemia, or something whereby this number was less, then that entire number would be low. So just because it's low doesn't mean it's telling you that it's good. It could be low because this red blood cells are low. The other reason is that maybe sometimes you have a lot of high blood sugars and a lot of low blood sugars. It's an average. So a lot of highs and a lot of lows will give you a good A1C as well. A lot of, a lot of highs only will give you a high A1C. And a lot of very, very low blood sugars can give you a, an absolutely normal A1C, okay? So it has to be looked in the context of your blood sugars also. So the question at one time was that everybody should be less than 6.5, but that has changed over time. 
So now, as time has gone by, they've realized that not everybody needs to be lower than 6.5. You could be somewhere between 6.5 and 7, and you would still be considered OK. So who can be less than 6.5, and who should be between 6.5 and 7, is you can see it on this chart. So if you were a young individual, say you're 40 or 35 years old, 50 years old, you don't have any other risk factors, you get diabetes, or if you had a heart attack and you smoke and you would get diabetes, and your life expectancy is pretty long, and otherwise you're doing fine, you would want to keep your A1C on the lower end. You'd be very, very stringent about it. Whereas if you're, you're somebody who is, has a lot of comorbidities, you're you know, at a much older in age, life expectancy is kind of on the shorter side, you have a lot of other vascular complications, you don't want to be too getting too low in, with your blood sugars. Because the more lower the A1C you want to achieve, you are going to have episodes of low blood sugars also sometimes. And if that's something we cannot risk, then it's better to keep that A1C in a range of six and a half to seven. Okay? So that's all that this tells you. It tells you, and this would be decided more by your physician, of course, in decision with you, as to what kind of goal you'd like to maintain. So this is a case. This is actually a real patient who saw me about a year ago. He is, uh, this is Chris, who is 32 years old. He was an occasional smoker. Smoked about six, seven cigarettes a week. And he came in from Eden Hospital with abdominal pain. He, had, he was thirsty and he had urination problems. And he went there and he was found to have a hemoglobin A1C of 13. So now you know that that's a super high number. He had high blood pressure, he had high cholesterol, and they told him you have diagnosis of diabetes. He weighed 300 pounds, he drank, he literally drank six, about six of those sodas a day or about a liter, a bottle of soda a day. He would have lots of junk food and chips and this and that. He even actually came into my office with all that stuff with him, most of it at least. He basically never exercised. He had a strong family history of diabetes. Both his father passed away at the age of, in his 40s with a heart attack. The mother thought that it was okay to eat whatever kind of food you wanted. He pretty much was living on nothing but a cup of noodles and he would have chicken nuggets and all these kind of things all day long. And I think spaghetti was the favorite. So he was discharged on insulin 40 units twice a day, which is 80 units, and then Novolog 30 units three times a day, which is another 90 units. So he was in about 160 to 170 units of insulin when he got discharged. So what did Chris do? Well, first he saw, he was referred to an endocrinologist. He came to me started checking his sugars, he started monitoring his blood pressure, cholesterol, changed his diet, quit smoking, exercise. He had, he had all these yearly checkups for various things, and he learned how to manage his life and his sugars. So where should we start, and how much is your goal when you're managing stuff with diabetes? Your A1C technically should be either less than seven. This is by the American Diabetic Association but the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology says less than 6.5. So you could be somewhere between 6.5 and 7, depending on what we talked earlier. The hypertension, if you have blood, high, high blood pressure in addition to diabetes, you want to be less than 130 over 80. And it's a good idea to keep yourself checked at home. You can monitor your blood pressures at home. Sometimes they vary when you come in to see a doctor. They might be higher. The cholesterol. The LDL, the, the low, it should be low. So L, it should be low. And that low should be either less than 70 or less than 100. So if it's less than 100, as if, you're, if you didn't have, say, a heart attack or you don't have other comorbidities or other problems, then less than 100 would be fine. Otherwise, less than 70 is where we want it to be. And HDL, which is the H goes with high, the higher, the better. So the more you exercise, you 
that you do and you take care of yourself, that HDL goes higher and higher. And the numbers are more than 50 for women and more than 40 for men. It's a shame that we always have to work harder. So the triglycerides, if you keep them less than 150, then that would be good. If, you, if you're otherwise, if you're someone who has had a heart attack in the past, aspirin is recommended. People more than 40 years of age with diabetes and other, some other risk factor, they recommend taking aspirin. And of course, it's always good to stop smoking. Smoking and diabetes is almost like you probably want to go looking for your gravesite. That's, it's, it's an absolute no-no. Smoking in general is an absolute no-no. So how do you exercise? What do you do? I have a lot of people who come in who just say that, I, you know, I can't get to a gym. I don't have a ride. I don't have this. Who we'll walk around the block. Walk, just walk. You can walk at whatever pace that's comfortable for you, but walking helps. If you can do this intense exercise and if you're, you're capable of doing it, then they would recommend 150 minutes per week. And so of intense aerobic physical activity. And which, so what you could do is you could walk half an hour every day. You could do a little bit more and do it in five days, take a weekend off. But the basic concept of this is that you should walk every day. About half an hour every day is good. I even tell people that if you find it hard to do it at one go, you could split it up into two times in the day if you like. And then their recommendations are that if you can, then you should do some performance resistance training twice per week, if that's permissible. So the whole goal in this is to walk the dog, OK? So it's very important to know what your sugars are when you have diabetes. We have patients who come in who they don't have a glucometer. They've never checked their sugars. I always tell them that if you're going to take your car for service, you have to take your car. It's very important that the mechanic sees the car. So for you, it's, it's, your, it's your glucometer that's very important as well. So if you don't bring your glucometer, it's almost like you haven't bought a part of you along with you. And that should stay with you all the time. And you should check your sugars, because that will tell you how you're doing throughout the day. So monitoring your blood sugars are very important. They say that 66% of people either do not test properly, they report skipping testing, and then they don't achieve that A1C. So how would you know how you're doing unless you see what you're doing? So if you don't have numbers in front of you, you don't know how you're doing. So a lot of people come in with no meter. It's almost like the visit is short. You know, you're fine, okay, you want your medicine, and bye-bye. But we can't do much about it if we don't see the numbers. So if you don't have a meter, it's good to go and get one. Either your physician can give it to you, you can go get a, a prescription, get it from the pharmacy. A lot of insurance companies will cover a certain kind of meter. Okay? So it's important to do this finger testing. All it needs is a little drop of blood. They're quite sophisticated nowadays. You put them on this little strip that gets inserted into the machine, and voila, you have a number. Okay, and that number actually stays in this machine. So about when I first started my practice, after I finished my res fellowship, I had a patient who came in with, she would, she would bring her log book. It had all these nice numbers written. And, you know, I was naive in those days, and I said, oh, she's so nice. She writes all her numbers down, and she brings it in. She's so diligent. And I, and I, and then I was fine, and I said, oh, that's a great job. And, then one day she comes in, and her A1C was somewhere like nine, but the numbers written in the book were, were beautiful. I mean, they were all like 100 and one. You know, everything was perfect. Mm -hmm. And so then I started becoming like a detective, and I started looking at it and thinking, hmm, these are all written kind of in the same pen. So maybe they are all written on one day just before she comes in. <laughs> And so I said, why don't you bring your machine? You know, let's, let's take a look. In those days, I wasn't very, if you wrote it down, it was OK. I, didn't, I was not insistent that you should bring your machine in. And so she finally brought the machine, and it showed that her numbers were in the 200s and the 300s. And she didn't want us to write them down, because she was scared that I was going to yell at her. So 
we have to remember that diabetes is not the doctor's problem, <laughs> okay? Diabetes is something that you have and they're here to help you and they, uh, they should be yelling at you, but it's for you to get better. So I started making a rule that if you do not have your meter, then you don't, don't come for a visit because otherwise we couldn't do anything. So, and the more you test, the more you have, the better off it is for you, okay? So when you look at this picture, you see rolling hills, you see a man with a suitcase, you see a train, and you see food, and you kind of wonder, like, why she put this up here? I came here to talk about, listen to about diabetes. What has this got to do with it? Well, essentially, it's just giving you four things that are going on, and they may not be anywhere related to each other. But, and when you look at this, you see sporadic numbers. This is a glucometer that's been downloaded. It's connected to the computer, and it has saved every single number that somebody has checked. And you can, it's about two weeks of a report, actually almost a month, and it's, it shows that the person checks every single day, but checks only once a day. Now when we, we look at it, it doesn't tell me what's going on after this 122. It didn't tell me what's happening any time in the evening. All I know is that your mornings are not so bad. It didn't tell me why you had a 158. It doesn't say anything. And it pretty much tells me exactly what this picture tells me. It doesn't tell me anything. It didn't tell me that this man took that train and went up to these hills and ate that food, right? So it didn't tell me that. It just shows me four different pictures. And that's exactly what this is showing, just sporadic numbers. So if you were to put this together as a story, the more numbers you have, it, there is a story to it. The story may not make sense to you, but it makes sense to me, okay? So it's very important. And as in time goes, it will make sense to you. So it's important to check more than once a day a fasting blood sugar, okay? So we have something called continuous glucose monitoring systems that have come out. I don't know how many of you have had have them placed. Does anybody have one here? Okay. So essentially it's a monitor that's placed on your arm. It's a size of a quarter. There's some of them that go in your abdomen. They're about the same size. And it takes a glucose reading for you. Some of them do it every 15 minutes. Some do it every five minutes, whatever. And you keep that in for about a week or 10 days, depending on the product. And it basically checks your sugar for you. And, but they always lag behind the, the actual reading of the sugar. So you want to do a finger stick pick anyway while you're on it, just to make sure that that's what it is. But they'll get better and better, I'm sure, with time. So we have something called a Freestyle Libra Pro. We place this little round thing, it's the size of a quarter, on your arm. It's, we scan it with this little machine and get it ready to go. You keep it in for two weeks. You can take a shower, you can do whatever you normally do, and then bring it back in a couple of weeks, and we download it to the computer, and we get the whole picture of what you've been doing for two weeks, okay? So essentially, that's the reader that gets swiped over this little white thing. So there are two different types of systems. There's a personal system, and there's a diagnostic. So the diagnostic is the one that someone like myself, or Dr. Kata, or somebody else would place on you in the office. You would wear it for two weeks. You don't get to see what's going on, though, unfortunately. You wear it, and you kind of still have to check your sugars and then you come back in two weeks, we take it out, we download it, and we get a full picture of what's going on, okay? The other one is that you actually get it yourself, you put it on yourself, you keep it for about a week, and you would change that sensor every seven days, and then you would swipe it with that reader that we showed you in the previous picture with this, this thing here. You would swipe it like that, and you would get a number like how this person got a 170, and you, or whatever else it is. So essentially, this little sensor is sitting on your skin, and it's sending this little, like little, uh, kind of tubing or little stick into your interstitial fluid, 
The whole process is painless. It doesn't hurt at all. Per se, people don't say they don't even feel this at all. And it checks your glucose level all the time. And then it sends it to this transmitter. So this is what you get. You get much more than what you would have got by checking. You have something every hour. So the person who looked really good, that person that you saw checking once a day, this is actually that same person's readings. You can see that his mornings are 113, 118. And then these are all his daytime readings. And you can see that at night, he goes as high as 300. His average is about 229, 195. But this is all of that two-week data, all scrunched up into 24 hours. And you can notice that this person doesn't have any low blood sugars. And it should be between this gray zone, but is all over the place. And looking at those numbers, you would have thought, oh, I'm doing a pretty good job, right? Because you're checking only once a day. But this A1C turned out to be 7.2. This is a continuation of that same person. As you go day by day, you can actually see what the person does. Once he starts eating meals, lunch, and dinner, you can see the rise in the sugars. So how many of you wear an insulin pump here? So an insulin pump essentially has insulin running in it 24 hours a day. They used to look something like this, look like a backpack. Now it's like a little beeper device where the insulin is, is in a reservoir inside here, and it goes by this little spaghetti tubing into your abdomen, and you would change this every third day. I mean, of course, you still need to check your sugars. You still need to take care of yourself. This is for people who are on insulin and who need it all the time. It basically gives you a continuous dose of insulin all throughout the day. So it's not a substitute that you would not check your sugars. You would still need to check your sugars and do everything else. <clears throat> we further modernized the insulin pump by adding a sensor. And, and then, then, of course, the pump would talk to the sensor and you would get your, your glucose numbers. So this tells you that when you have multiple daily injections, you have a lot of variability because you're injecting so many times a day versus if you were to use a pump, you would have lesser variability and your sugars would be better. So we talked to Chris. Chris comes 10 months later. He came in between, but at 10 months, he had lost 60 pounds. His A1C is down to 6.8 from 13. He quit smoking. He took out all the junk food, and he ran six miles a day. He said instead of taking, um, he used to take a bus to work, he just ran to work. And he ran six miles one way, and in the evening, he took the bus back. So we switched him his insulin over. We put him on insulin four times a day, and we put him on metformin, and we put him on Victoza. Victoza is a GLP-1 analog. So we're not gonna talk much about medications today, but essentially it does help him with his diet, losing weight, feeling better. And he did see an eye doctor, and his feet exam were normal, and everything else was fine. But we didn't really know whether he didn't have any complications at that point. So let's talk about the complications of diabetes. So diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, can cause a variety of things. The most commonly it causes is neuropathy. It causes kidney damage. And it causes eye problems. Okay, And then it causes larger vessels to get involved your heart and your brain to get strokes. So we'll talk about these in detail. And then one thing we always kind of forget is to go to the dentist. We'll talk about that. So if you talk about your foot care, it's always very important to keep an eye on your feet. Keep them clean. Always wear good fitting shoes. You don't want to walk around with these flip flops where your feet are half hanging out or whatever, and get, because a lot of people have calluses, and those calluses, they start breaking down. You start getting ulcers. You want to take a warm shower. Don't take a hot shower. Take care of your feet every day. Clean between the toes. 
pay attention to your nails. It's very important you cut your nails flat across. Don't cut them in a curve. Because if you cut them in a curve, then they have a tendency to grow as an ingrown toenail. I had a patient who went to Las Vegas a few years ago, and he had intense neuropathy, which means that he had no feeling in his feet at all. And he walked barefoot there in the summer. And he came with third, three third degree burns. So, because he didn't feel the ground. I mean, he didn't even know that he was getting burned. So, I mean, of course, that's an extreme of everything. But it's, it's very important that you wear clothes fitting shoes. Don't go walking around barefoot, especially if you go to the beach or areas like that. There's a little piece of something might go in. You wouldn't even know. Oh, it's also important to see a podiatrist. You can ask your uh, physician to refer you to one. They help you with cutting nails, also just in general care of your feet. So neuropathy essentially is when you have all these symptoms. You can have one or many of these symptoms. You, uh, most of the time people say that their tingling and burning is the most common. You can also feel like you just don't have feeling, like the man who went to Vegas. You can, you can say that my feet are always cold, they're numb, whatever. So any kind of combination of anything. It's essentially it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So sometimes you can get tingling numbness from back pain. You can get a nerve impingement. It would look exactly the same way. There's numerous treatments that are out there, the different kind of medications that one can take. 50% of these are asymptomatic. People don't have symptoms, so you always want to look for it. And keeping your blood sugars under control is probably the best therapy that you can do for it. Okay. So who should one see? A lot of people get confused. Do I go see an optometrist, an ophthalmologist, an optician? What's the difference between them? What are they? So your ophthalmologist is your trained MD who can also, they also have specialties. So sometimes they're only interested in the cornea, they might be good at the retina, they might be good at something else. Um, they do a lot of these eye surgeries and so forth. They can definitely do your eye exam as well. They do a lot of minor surgeries as well. But the optometrists usually are the ones that you find in a Target, Costco, wherever. They're, they're more of eye exams, they give you your glasses. They might be able to do a small little procedure here and there. But for the most part, they're more of just the eye exam people. And opticians are mostly the people who fit your glasses for you and your contacts and your prescriptions and so forth. Okay. So once you have diabetes, if you're type 1, you would want to do it within five years of their diagnosis. But if you're type 2, you want to go right at that time. It's always important to do it on a yearly basis. In pregnancy, you, know, you want to do it before you get pregnant if you have diabetes and every three months once you are pregnant. So it is the commonest cause of blindness. Can definitely be prevented if you go on a yearly basis to see somebody. Taking care of not smoking, taking care of blood pressure, glucose control uh, will definitely evade it. You could treat it with laser and so forth when once you see an ophthalmologist. But the best part is to prevent it rather than go after it later on. So dental care, it's very important to see a dentist when you have diabetes. Gum care is equally important. That because it basically when you have high glucose, it reduces your blood supply to your gums. There's decreased saliva production and so forth. You'll have more caries and more teeth problem and gum problems. So they're more two or three, three times more likely to develop gum disease. So that's very important that you go and see somebody. Stress, everybody thinks that it increases it by 200 points. It doesn't. Stress and diabetes will increase it a little bit. There are a lot of stress hormones that get released. We also have a phenomenon called the dawn phenomenon where you have there are hormones in your body that try to get you out of bed in the morning, like cortisol, there's a, your adrenal hormones, and so forth. They raise your blood sugar. 
and those sometimes will increase it enough to that the insulin is not enough for it, and you might see a higher sugar in the morning. You go to bed and you say, I was 100, but I woke up with 140. How did that happen? That sometimes can happen from this. Stress in general increases your sugars. It doesn't go by 100 points. You will see some rise, though. These are the different hormones we talked about. There's growth hormone, cortisol, glucagon, epinephrine. They get produced, and when you're under stress or other kind of emotional problems that you're having, but they also get produced in the early mornings in order to make your glucose levels increase. What happens when you're sick? Diabetics do get sick, of course. Everybody knows that. It's important to keep yourself well hydrated and to, take, to check your blood sugars and to check and to give your scheduled insulin if you're on it. Sometimes you need more insulin. And of course, if things are not getting better, it's best to go and see someone. So the most important is to, you don't want to be dehydrated. You don't want to have very high sugars that you're developing ketones, develop something called diabetic ketoacidosis, which will lead you into the hospital. And, or you don't want to become hypoglycemic by not eating as much and still taking your insulin and so forth. So you want to match your insulin requirements, your, your medications to your glucose levels, okay? So your management of low blood sugars. I'm sure if someone has diabetes here, you've had a low blood sugar in the past. We call that hypoglycemia. How do you treat a low blood sugar? So it's very important that you get yourself 15 grams of carbohydrates. And how do you get 15 grams of carbohydrates? You get it through four ounces of either milk or orange juice or something. You could take three glucose tablets, they're about five grams each. But it's important to get that 15 grams in. And so what you do is you check your blood sugar, eat, and then wait 15 minutes and then recheck it again to see if it has gone back to normal. You don't check your blood sugar and then have a nice big candy bar or a full cup of soda and then check your sugar or never check your sugar. You never do that. You always want to see what your sugar is after you've been done the treatment. And you have to remember, it's a treatment and not a treat, okay? So Chris, at 15 months later, has lost 150 pounds. I couldn't even recognize him. He runs uh, six miles a day. He eats healthy. He's, he's on metformin, but he takes it kind of sporadically when he needs it. And that's him. So if he's 150 pounds lighter, and if he can do it, so can you. Thank you.